Welcome to the Becoming a Foreigner podcast where we interview young, extraordinary people, talk about relatable topics for the youth, and interview young entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Rawa. And I'm your host, Ona. And today we're joined by Genevieve Stafford Jack. So, in today's episode, we're going to be talking all about property investing for young people. Whether you're a first time buyer or looking to expand your portfolio, this episode is for you. So, Janelle, we would like to know, when did you first decide, I want to come into the property investment field? Or when did you think, you know what, this is an interesting topic, let me go into the property section. Firstly, thank you so much for having me, ladies. (laughs) So, to answer the question, and it's a very good question, I didn't decide it. I kind of happened to accidentally land up in this particular space. Some time back, early 2000s, I bought my first two bed, one bath. I did it up as we would, and I stayed in there. Life circumstances changed. And then I thought, actually, I don't really want to stay in this neighborhood anymore. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a bad neighborhood, but it wasn't also the neighborhood I was wanting to stay Mm long-term. So I eventually found that the rental in the neighborhood would cover my bond and a little extras. So if I go somewhere else and I rent, somebody else will be paying mm-hmm. my flat for me. And that's how I accidentally fell into property investing. Mm-hmm. Um, so my question is, how can young people find the right property to invest in? Finding the right property. It's a bit of a tricky one. So let's start off with what, what I like to call knowing your ABCs. Mm-hmm. You first need to understand before investing in any property, what do you actually want to get out of the property? Mm-hmm. So you kind of start with the end in mind. Mm-hmm. So you understand there are different strategies or there are different ways of investing in property. What is the strategy you're looking for? Here's an example. Do I want to buy a property, fix it up, and sell it to somebody else? That's mm-hmm. called a flip. Mm-hmm. So you're looking for a huge injection one time, but there's a little bit of work that goes in So that is a strategy. So you ask yourself, if I'm looking for a flip strategy, then that's going to then determine your area. Which area is then going to give you this type of property or you could look for this property? And then you go and find your property. So as a young person or anybody interested in property investing, always first understand, what do I want from property? Does that help steer that question? (laughs) Wonderful stuff. So um, what are some benefits of investing in property or what do you recommend for it? Like what should we invest for property yeah, in South Africa? So what I find is when you're starting out, the best thing to do is look to start small. Oftentimes as adults, as young adults, and people just to start acquiring or aspiring to climb the ladder, we first think, I want to buy a big block of flats Mm -hmm. and I'm going to bring in a whole lot of money and then I'll be set. Mm -hmm. Not realizing how much work and energy goes into acquiring a block of flats. Mm -hmm. So I would say, start off small. Ask yourself, what is small for me where I am? Because like me, you could be an accidental landlord Mm -hmm. because that was also not a nice experience, but it really just helped me focus what is it that i want ultimately from property Mm -hmm. so i would say start off small and then understand where it is that you're going just so that you can navigate the pathway Mm -hmm. whereas if you go for a big block of flats you don't even understand town planning at that time what is town planning why do i need to consult the council why do i need to do this why do i need to do that and eventually that could just drain you from hey, I don't know if this property thing is for me. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you started small Mm -hmm. and you navigate it from a small level, Mm -hmm. small chunks help you get further. What should people look for um, when evaluating a potential investment property? I believe before you even go into the space of evaluation, you first should look for education. Mm -hmm. Why would I say that? In education, it's then going to teach you What are all the strategies? Just like the flip that I mentioned earlier, there's your buy to rent option. But then there's also what we have in townships they call um, a back room. Or you have in different areas as well. You can rent out your your house, 
have different rooms rented out to different people, you're bringing in money. Mm. So when you are exposed to those different strategies, then you actually can understand for yourself, okay, what is it that I now need to look out for? So my first point or my point of reference would always be educate, education. Because when you find the property, there's something we call analysis mm -hmm. and running numbers. We analyze in this neighborhood, what's going on? Are there people that are renting rooms like student accommodation? Okay, if it's student accommodation, what do I need to get my property accredited for students? Mm -hmm. So all of that comes with education. Because when you get education, you get the broad spectrum of what there is. And then you are then able to narrow down, mm, this is my focus, this is my strategy, this is what ticks my boxes. Mm -hmm. And as a person, then you can then run with, how do I find it? When I find it, what do I do next? I must analyze what's happening. And when I finish analyzing, I need to run the numbers. And when I finish running the numbers, does the numbers show that this is a profitable deal or not? Mm -hmm. In terms of education, what do you mean? Like school, books, or research? So in terms of education, uh, what you will find is, just like UNISA will offer different packages or different courses, you will find some people informally in within the space of property, offering a property investment course. For example, when I first got into property, the right way, not the default way, I'd gone and I'd sat in a class where they spoke about property investing. Mm -hmm. So I, it was a three-day course over the weekend. Mm -hmm. It was extensive. It was pricey. But when I look back at what we had lost in business versus investing in that particular education, that's when I realized pricey is relative. Mm. We had lost a whole lot more than what we gained in that short period of time. So you'll find very informally in the industry, there are quite a few people that offer your two-day courses or your three-day courses. And then you'll be able to find that information online. One of the things I did during COVID was online for four evenings. I taught from two to three, three hours in the evening, having people ask all the questions that they needed. Mm -hmm. And that's also a form of education as well. So you could go to YouTube as well. So you would find that when you hear somebody speaking from conviction, they've got examples of what they've done, then you'll be able to start building, is this person credible? Do I like the way they speak? how they explain sort of some stuff. So this is how you eventually navigate, and I call it down the wormhole of the internet, because you will eventually come to what you're looking for. So what are some common mistakes you find young people make when they're investing in property? The biggest, most common mistake is, I want to make a lot of money now. <laughs> <laughs> and I find that's not only with the young people, it's with people generally, but I find it more predominant in the young people. Because if this is a property and I'm gonna be collecting rent, I wanna collect as much rent as possible. Mm -hmm. And then what ends up happening is, they go for the big, hairy, audacious goals, which is good, but without education, without mentorship, without guidance mm -hmm. and literally just going in after looking at a, a video on YouTube for 15 minutes mm -hmm. that said we got five thousand dollars and da, da 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 then they take the strategy from a different company country bring it here and then all of a sudden it's like oh property doesn't work because they're frustrated along the way. Mm -hmm. So that's what I find the most common and also the biggest mistake many people make. How can people finance their first investment property? There's a number of ways. Going back to what is your strategy? Mm -hmm. So when you understand what is your strategy, you'll then also be able to understand how much money do you need? How much money do you need then goes back to, hey, mom and dad, I'm interested in this particular property. If you saw within the age of being at school, and when I say at school, it could be matric to varsity, and things like that, where you do, haven't built up your credit record. Mm. If you're a young adult, maybe say 21 onwards or whenever, or whatever your age is, and you're staying in your own property and you're working, then you can go to the bank. You know, bank, I have gone 
into the market and I've checked out property and I'm interested in this particular property and then you do a bond application. But back to the what we mentioned earlier is the education because when you could do your numbers and make sure you've analyzed everything and your tenant can pay your property, you can still stay where you are and your, your property really then is an investment property. So um, when parents say that they bought the certain property for their children, what do, what do you mean by that? Like, is it under their name? Nine out of 10 times, no. That's a very good question. That's actually a brilliant question. Nine out of 10 times, no. Mm -hmm. And why I say that, the general population, and I want to put us all in that bracket, there are some education bits you do not know mm -hmm. until you get into some sort of trouble or into the thick of that particular industry. So here's what I mean. Some parents will say, I bought this property for my child, so if I die, my child can inherit this property. That's one scenario. Mm -hmm. But when they pass away is there a legal document that says this particular property belongs to my child where is that stated because it could then be under the parents name mm -hmm. and then when it comes to deceased estates everything is frozen and then what mm -hmm. right so that's one crazy scenario other it other parents that are well into the education or have come into a bit of a fix and then started you know resolving for their problem they've gone into a trust and then they'll open up what we call a living trust but opening up a living trust is not just a, a, a basic thing of coming to somebody that helps you with that i want to open a living trust they're going to ask you questions what is it that you want this trust to do mm -hmm. who are the benefit beneficiaries of this trust who actually is going to execute this if tomorrow you pass away? So the living trust then owns the property and the proceeds from the property then goes to the kids because then in the trust, this is how we're saying X must go to one kid, Y must go to another kid. But then there's another one, which I think is really an awesome one, is if I said I bought this property for my kid, I'm actually saying as my child is going through school, mm -hmm. I'm going to be paying this particular property. And by the time they finish with school, it takes 20 years to finish up a bond. By the time they're 18 years old, I've got two years left of this bond if I've paid it traditionally every month, which now means this particular property is two years to being bond free. So what some parents then do, they'll go to the bank and say, we've paid up 18 of the 20 years can i take out what we call equity from this property to pay my child's university and further studying fees which then means by the time your child is done with studying they are debt free they don't have student loans sitting on their shoulder mm -hmm. so that's another form when some parents say i bought this property for my child because i want my child's education when they're at a certain age to be paid for. And then the flip side to that, they could say to the child, you could stay there while you're in university, I'm gonna pay for the next two years. And when this is done, I'm gonna gift you this property. And what you do with this property then becomes your little baby. Mm. So it's in a number of different ways when us parents have these glib statements, this property is for my child. But as a parent, we know what we are looking at. Mm -hmm. You know, when I finish school, we called it matric back then. <laughs> when I was finished with grade 12, it was like, okay, so now what? My mom said, I didn't even go to grade 12. So well done in your accolade, but there's no money to study further. So my first job, I was a cleaner. Mm -hmm. And then I was a cashier at ShopRite Checkers. And I eventually built myself up, but with the support from my mom, where she said, in small ways, I can support you, but this is it. So it really goes back to what is it that your parents may have gone through that they make this statement, this property is for my child. Does it make sense? Yes. <laughs> awesome stuff. So um, what are some strategies on maximizing rental income for property investment? 
What I find some of the strategies again goes back to property investing is such an interesting um, kettle of fish. I always find what is the area that you're in. Mm. That's how you'll be able to maximize it. So here's two wild examples. And I call them wild because some people actually look and say, is that possible? But because I saw it here. <laughs> you know, I saw it here. And my husband did it. My husband's quite the property somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we get into property. My husband and I are in debt. Way back in our businesses, there's quite a few things that we had made. Epic mistakes. So we got into a lot of trouble. We got into there and there was something called sourcing. Meaning I'd find a property, I'd run the numbers, I would do the analysis, I'd put that particular thing into a proposal, and I'll go and find somebody that's got money to buy this particular property and the idea. But I always looked in what area is going to yield an income where there's more than one tenant. So here's your first clue. More than one tenant, I believe, is a way to maximize stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got a two bed, one bath. The two of you decide you're gonna come and rent that property from me. The month you cannot pay your rental income to me, she can, which then means already half of my bond is taken care of and I only have to subsidize. And until you pay it, then we'll be able to put it in, right? Mm -hmm. I've got a three bed close to a university. How am I gonna maximize it? Do I want students? Firstly, students are, messy <laughs> very messy mom and dad have been cleaning up we've been screaming the whole house down we've got auntie to help so that you can study and we've got all of these different processes in place so the ch child gets there and i'm like okay so what do we need to do and i'd seen one of the kids say i've never used a microwave how do i use this thing i've seen kids coming from really disadvantaged backgrounds where they've opened the shower because cold water came out. Mm -hmm. It was good. Why? Because we bought cold water at home. It was cool. Mm -hmm. But when another kid opened the shower, it's like there's only hot water that comes from the... So the education, and I thought to myself, hmm, I don't know if I want a student accommodation. Mm -hmm. There's so many different variables to it, right? But you can still maximize your income because you can rent out your property. What do students do? You guys go and you get projects at school. Mm -hmm. You need to write papers at school. So if I put in a printer in my student accommodation and go to Macro and buy reams of paper, if you go to Postnet, they're going to say to you two rand a copy or one rand a copy. What if in my house I say 50 cents a copy? Mm -hmm. Firstly, a lot of students are late with their projects. Mm -hmm. What do they end up doing at night? Oh my God, I need to print this thing. Where do I print it? The machine is at home, the printing machine. And then you'd be, I'd be able to, as a landlord, collect money from there. So that's already a tick. That's another way in my student accommodation to collect money. Now, if I've got the same property, potentially close to a mall, how many people are waiting tables until the wee hours of the night? Now they need to go home. They have to wait for public transport. What if the three of us were friends and we waited tables together at Mall X? You come into, the three of us come in to stay here. We all know each other. We've got a cleanliness level with each other. The landlord is going to collect three times rent. So there's different ways you can maximize it depending on where your property is situated. Mm -hmm. And also just another random one for student accommodation. What I had found the most interesting thing, there was a house mother in one of the properties that we that we had in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And a couple of them came and said, I know that as a house mom, you're not supposed to wash our clothes or iron our clothes, but we dying here. Okay, we dying here. <laughs> so what she would then do is she would take the clothes on a Friday, she'd go through to her property, her house. Do quite a few loads of washing, hang it up on the line, and then she subcontracted to her helper, had a whole lot of different stuff ironed, and then the, the, the next day, the Saturday, close of close of Saturday, she would then say to her, her helper, here's your, your overtime money. She packed up all of these things, went back to student accommodation, 
And these kids were like, oh, thank you. Oh, you're walking on water. You're the best thing under the sun. Mm. That's also another way where you can also get the kids living in a home kind of environment. But because they're ready to take out their spending money mm. to pay somebody else to do what mom and dad has been doing all the time, mm -hmm. then it becomes a very different business model. So mm. some people will say, oh, the poor students. No. You can still do this if you're a student. <laughs> so that's another wild thought.